let's get it started. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're so excited to be here. I hope you're enjoying this conference as much as we do right now. Um, our names are Michaela and Tim. We are with SAP Cloud Platform and we are part of the Cloud Platform Performance Team. Our team basically has the pretty ambitious mission of taking care of performance throughout our whole cloud platform, starting from hardware, basically all the way up to applications. Now today we're here to share a little of the knowledge with you that we built past, over the past year basically, building reference applications as well as helping others at our company, making the applications increasingly awesome. So, how many of you have seen the, uh, the keynote from Bjorn Gerke? Hands up. One, well, nice. Awesome. So by now, you, you understand SAP people are lovely dorks, right? And bonus points if you understand what the reference is from. Today, we are taking you on a journey from a monolith into a nicely groomed Cloud Foundry application, modular, microservice based, that leverages the app in the right way. And before we take on the journey, we need to share something with you. We may have slightly misrepresented what the talk will be about because we have only 30 minutes, and so we will not be exactly able to show you as much Java code as we would like. Moreover, most of these things happened in one particular story, but you know, narrative and giving you as much information as possible means that we are going also to merge some other learnings from other things. So, take it as a journey. All these things have happened to someone somewhere. Most of these things have happened to particular someones. Probably you, or, or, or us, any of us. Now, with applications, as they say, if you're smart, right, you start with a monolith, of course. And there's so many good reasons to do so. Like, it's just super easy to start with coding with your application. You have less time to market. It's easier to debug you basically don't have to deal with all the intricacies of distributed systems. And of course, there are other thousand good reasons to, to mention here. However, we want to make an addition to that statement, which is monitor your runtime in order to find out when to splinter out to microservices before it's too late. Now, we have a sample application for this uh, session. Um, which is just a super simple uh, web application um, which deals with time series data. So we have a post endpoint where you can just upload time series data and of course a get endpoint where you can retrieve time series data by ID. Right now, um, this application is implemented as just one single Cloud Foundry application and with that kind of architecture, that gives us already the possibility to basically scale it horizontally, which is awesome, and it can be scaled vertically. Don't, don't do that. Please don't. Not, not good for you. Now, um, I already hear some of you thinking, like, well, this doesn't really look like a microservice architecture and, and fancy at all, and... You're right. Turns out you're actually right. This is something that we see uh, sometimes, where people assume that just by the power of safe push, your code, maybe your legacy application, becomes immediately a microservice. That's not how it works. It takes actually quite some effort, and today we're going to discuss exactly that, to get you to a state where your application can proudly be called a microservice. By the way, if this doesn't end on t-shirts, by the end of the day, we're doing something wrong around here. But Michaela, one also has to mention that, I mean, sometimes a monolith is just a thing. I mean, yeah. not every application has to be like, cloud scale and is called a thousand times per customer every single time somewhere, some when, and sometimes a monolith is just good enough. So don't be ashamed of your monoliths as long as they work. But you need to understand when they work. And with cloud software, monitoring is the key. Have you ever heard that, uh, that story about you know, the tree falling in the forest? If there is no one there to listen, did it make a sound? With your transactions on the cloud, that's exactly what happens. If you don't monitor them, for you, they practically, they practically did not happen. And when people start thinking in terms of monitoring, I mean, we all immediately think about how much CPU are we using, how much memory we're using, what is the 95% percentile in response time, and that's all very good, but that's not necessarily the way your users actually evaluate your service, right? 
it, it's a little bit like, hey, the response was an error, but hey, it was blazingly fast and super memory efficient. But actually finding out what to monitor is surprisingly hard. But there's something to the rescue, which is the service level agreement. You might say like, this is boring and corporate stuff and boring. what are we doing here? Um, but that's only half of the story. Now, we're here keeping it just super simple, looking at an, an example service level agreement for, for one of our APIs, which is the POST API. So it comes with a quota per customer and max total requests per second and stuff like that. But what does it really give us? If you look, for example, at the quota per customer, as well as max total requests per second, you eventually start, most probably, you start to think about topics like rate limiting, or you even think about topics like how to enforce that because you eventually have to enforce that even in code. And if we start, for example, thinking about what is the maximum amount of data that customers are going to send over us with one request and then we are going to send back, then we start thinking about what kind of data we are supposed to use to test the application. And then we start wondering, for example, how fast does it have to be? And that gives us the targets for what we need to certify our application based on, uh, on the load tests, right? And remember, under promise and over deliver, that's how you make customers happy. That's key. Now, when you look at uh, topics like failure rate and target availability, you're most probably thinking about your architecture in general. Like, uh, you, you eventually start to ask yourself, if I want to have a target availability and um, max failure rate, is you, my, my monolithic application still enough? Is it still what, what we're looking for? And by the way, since we're talking about target availability, uh, let's throw another thing out there, Michele. Yeah. So, how many of you have deployed applications on Cloud Foundry where there was just one instance of that? Hands up. We all have, right? It's the monolith. It's the one true monolith. Now, when you're going after the magic four nines of availability, 99.99, .99, that's the holy grail, right? That boils down to fundamentally 8.6 seconds per day. And it's little. It's really little. It is so little that it takes me longer to tell you how little it is than what it actually is, right? And containers crash. We have heard it over and over and over again in the talks of this application. Containers crash. Cloudfront is very good at bringing them back. There are many reasons why containers crash, and later we'll, we'll discuss a couple of them. But it takes time to resurrect containers. Cloud Foundry has to notice, your software has to spin up, and maybe it's doing some initialization. So don't do singletons. Create your application to work with horizontal scalability, and make sure that there is always something there to answer the, the requests of your clients. And since you are talking about containers that crash, one other thing that we all do immediately when we start Monolith is that we hide state into it. Maybe we're not thinking about it, but imagine the case you're getting a response from an HTTP client and you send back an accepted, which is a promise that says eventually you'll get something out of it, not right now, but eventually, and then you take your response, you put it on an executor, and that is executing. Well, if the container goes down like a brick, your task that you took on on behalf of the customer is gone and you broke a promise. And that is the kind of trust that is very hard to regain again when you lose someone else's jobs. And it's not only about the asynchronous tasks. There's much more that we tend not to think much about. At any rate, whenever we are thinking in terms of state, in Cloud Foundry, state goes into backing services. Doesn't go in containers. You cannot trust them. Your state is for fate when the container goes. In particular, your session data is gone and with the containers. And for example, people tend to put those things in Redis because it makes sense. You don't want to pin a customer on one particular application server, then it's ugly when the server is not there anymore. And do not use the file system of the container. Don't trust it. It's ephemeral, your container crashes, the file system goes, unless it's backed by a, um, a local volume meaning that there is actually a service behind that will persist the state somewhere else. So, I mean, that, that's all fun and games, but 
let, let's finally go back to the title of this talk, Splitting that Monolith. Now, I think, I... When, it, when it comes to, to splitting an application, um, l l let's just say here for, for, for another second, I mean, uh, some other people than us say since ages, basically at least since two years, that splitting an application has to be very well controlled. Apparently, splitting an application is as hard as splitting the atom, and the outcome can be equally devastating if done wrong. By the way, uh, we are from the Cloud Platform Performance team. We may be a little biased in thinking in terms of making stuff fast and reliable. So you may have heard from others other criteria for splitting microservices. We're going to give you a set of criteria and a mindset focused on making stuff work well. There are also other reasons why you would split and may, maybe other different granularities, but take these into account as well. Now, let's finally start to look at um, asynchronous processing, for example, in order to split out uh, a microservice. Now, as you have seen already, our web application comes with a post endpoint to upload time series data. Now, what we do in order to split that API a bit is rather than basically accepting a request and applying maybe even algorithms on that, what we do is we just put that request into a queue and um, like for example Redis or RabbitMQ, it's whatever you feel comfortable with basically. Um, so, and we queue the task in a cache. Now eventually, um, eventually, yeah, there we go. Eventually a dedicated worker node starts fetching and actually processing that um, request from the queue. Um, from a client perspective, this of course is a breaking change because it's uh, now a 202 accepted and um, you just get a location header. Um, and by its nature, by the way, the worker node of course comes with no web API and of course no route. Now, once the worker is done um, with re uh, basically processing the request, it stores the result in the database as it used to be already. Now, um, the client, of course, can, can use uh, the same get endpoint in order to fetch time series data um, from, from the same endpoint, of course. Um, you can use basically polling or server send events uh, in order to do that. And w when we look at that now, um, we already gained some awesome advantages, actually. Now, for example, we got rid of the whole state in the, in the web API, and you can be pretty confident once you return a 202 accepted to a, to a client, you can be very confident that there's, there's the task in the queue and eventually the worker starts firing up and working on it. Um, also, um, so let, let's, yeah, there we go. Um, so you can be pretty sure that you will have no loss after you, you accept it. Also, um, a, an awesome advantage is that our web API, um, you can be pretty sure that um, there's no real stuff going on so since it's quite dumped now, which is basically very good. Also, since we have a dedicated worker node, we can just fire that up individually by its process type, which is a worker. Now, we have the worker that is taking jobs from the queue and it's processing them. And what is that? It's state. Now, if the worker deletes the task from the queue, when it starts processing it and the worker goes down, the task is gone. So remember, when, you are, when you're using this type of architectural patterns, please think in terms of reservations, optimistic locking. There are several different mechanisms you can use to make sure that the jobs don't disappear until they are really done. Think in terms a little bit like small transactions, because you do not want to lose jobs. And since we're talking about making stuff nicer and nicer, something that we, uh, we tend to see quite a lot is that people tend to get a bit old-fashioned with HTTP APIs. So, for example, when you, when you upload something, you send a 201 created, that's very nice. When you want to retrieve something, you get a 200 OK with the body of the response, with the, the entity in the body of the response. But today, we have a lot of interesting toys. We have web sockets, we have server sent events, that are really nice, by the way, to make uh, APIs for web applications that need to be updated as the data comes in, where you can populate, for example, charts that you retrieve tons of data from the backend. Something that 
happens when you go a little less traditional in the way you do HTTP is that you move away from uh, the normal responses and you go into HTTP chunking. With HTTP chunking, what you're saying is that you start streaming the response out before you know exactly what it will contain. You're going to build the response, very likely, as you stream it out. What does that mean? It means that your status line, which say, for example, 200 OK, starts, get, get, goes out before you have done all the work to ensure that the response will actually be successful. So it can be the case that, for example, when you're streaming stuff out of, out of a database, then you have an error halfway through, and there with HTTP chunking is not really so nice, but modern uh, libraries actually can handle that, and they will notice that there is an error. They will not know, for example, what, but they will know that there is an error. And it gets very efficient, and we're going to talk later about why streaming is the key. Oh, finally, we can, we can uh, of finally. course, show the compulsory 12-factor app slides, because, I mean, there's no real microservice talk without at least one pointer to that. I'm pretty sure it was in the call for papers. Uh, true, true. Slides. <laughs> so, as you've seen, we're treating our backing services as attached resources. Multiple instances can connect to that, which is good. Uh, we execute our applications as one or even more stateless processes. So now we're even, we even got rid of the, the, the state in the JVM of the, of the actual request coming in. And we can scale out our web API as well as the worker nodes individually by their process type, which is awesome. However, so we have gone from a very traditional monolith already to something that's asynchronous. We had a change in the REST API because now we started doing accepted instead of creating which means that we need to touch up the service level agreement. We are executing jobs asynchronously, which means we have to give a promise to the customers about how long it's gonna take. And it's a promise to them as much as it is to yourself, because you should actually test for this under as realistic circumstances as possible, and potentially more than that. So. Now that's cool. So um, now we have an even more scalable API already, which is great. And eventually it gets even too much again. And um, so what we, what we, I mean, containers come and go and um, for example, your web API may, may be overloaded again or you, you have, have a bug. I mean, yeah, sometimes developers create bugs. You may, be, um, you may be losing requests for customers because containers crash too much, and then those requests go down with them before you manage to put the stuff into the queues. Or you, you face up uh, memory issues in your web yeah. API. That, that might happen from time to time. Uh, but by the way, I think it's the second time that we're talking about memory issues. Yeah. And in the I face think it's of, time. It's, it's time. In the face of disaster, we have a couple of toys we want to share with you that we open sourced that we hope will make your life troubleshooting your applications much, e much easier. We have... So the first one is something I, I really like. It, it's, a, um, it's a Java plugin for the CF CLI, which is super useful. It's just a plugin that you install, install as, as you're used to do it, and it enables you to use um, CF Java heap dump, and the application name, for example, to just fetch a heap dump out of your container. Same applies for thread dumps, and that's awesome. Moreover, not only you, you're always there when you want a heap dump, sometimes you're there when, sometimes you need a heap dump when you're not there to watch. And from, uh, from Ben Hale, we have learned that there is the JVM kill mechanism that is coming to the, to, the, to the JVM, where when there is a crash of the container, a heap dump will be done and saved for you, for example, on local volume. But sometimes you actually want to start troubleshooting before things get too dire. So we have open sourced a small Java agent, as in uh, Java Lang instrumentation API, that will monitor, depending on configurations that you provide, for example, the uh, old generation has increased by more than 50% in the last two minutes, will uh, we'll monitor how the memory usage of your application is doing and take heap dumps for you using the same mechanisms as the JVM kill, and we are working to integrate it in the, in the community job build pack in a way where you will not notice the difference between the two mechanisms. You have heap dumps when you want them, you have heap dumps when it crashes, and you have heap dumps when you think you need it because you specify in advance these, these conditions. Now, back to our REST API. We have split up in our monolith the web API away from processing tasks 
by putting in between backing services. Is it good enough? No. Or maybe yes, for a certain amount of time, but at some point, the load is too much. So what's the problem with our web API? It's another monolith. It's actually doing very different things. They are so different, in fact, that they are doing different types of tasks. Take the data, save it into, put it in the queue for processing, or go to a database and fetch the data and give it to the client. So we are actually using different dependencies. We are consuming different services. And when you start coding these APIs, in particular under load, you'll see that necessarily they behave differently in terms of how much CPU they need to process resources, how much memory, how long do the client connections they open, how many, uh, the, the, how vulnerable they are in terms of dependencies going down. So what do we do? We split, we split it, again. it again. Of course we do. So now we, now we split the web API into several different parts. So now we have, in, in, in that picture, we have a dedicated ingestion API, which just deals with the uploading part. And we have a query API. And to illustrate it even more, we, we, we split up the query API once again in order to distinguish between small query APIs as well as large query APIs. And since we're talking about the large query APIs, there is something really important which you consider always when, when it comes to querying data, which is streaming. Tim, have you ever seen what happens when you actually do an OData query asking for top 50,000 resources of a type to a JVM it's and you're not streaming? gory. It gets like hell riser <laughs> kind of gory. It's really disgusting. Now, um, it's, w w when you look at that part, um, you, you, you will most probably notice that even, for example, when our query API goes down like a brick for, for various reasons, we still have our ingestion API up and running, which is good. So you can basically even distinguish between business critical endpoints and other endpoints, um, which, I mean, Sam Newman is basically referring to that as splitting workloads, which pretty much hits the point, actually. And by splitting our APIs into different Cloud Foundry applications, we need to hide this change from our users. How do we do that? With an edge router. What is an edge router? It's fundamentally a proxy. Now, there is a bit of confusion in terms of terminology. Imagine it as a sort of very flexible proxy that can really split load well. And depending on what you're going to do in your application and how you want to split it, you'll need different capabilities in the edge router. For example, let's talk about REST APIs. We have a slash time series, and depending on the HTTP verb, get or post, you actually want to do different applications. So we already know we have to split by path. We have to split by verb. Maybe we are doing uh, um, server-side events, and we are doing also more traditional HTTP APIs, and those behave very differently. So maybe we want to put the server sent events into different nodes that scale separately. So now our edge router needs to be able to split, to split by media type. And, uh, and there are other things, for example, query parameters when you're using protocols like OData and you're putting a lot of logic into the queries. And um, this is something very important for a cloud, and that's why we fundamentally have a lot of proxies. So much that in the old good times, we used to say that every real programmer makes its own text editor, and today in the cloud, everyone has its own proxy. Or it, it feels like that, fundamentally. We even have our own inside SAP, we call it the app router, that does this type of, uh, of splittings, and it's, it works particularly well for our SAP cloud platform. But there are many possibilities out there, and you should really pick your edge router to be the one that, uh, that is best for you. And since we're talking about splitting APIs, so let's make a recap of what are the kind of things that we should consider when we want to split a web API in terms of making them work really well. It's about what we need to invest in terms of resources to serve requests. It's about which dependencies we need to consume, which services we need to consume to service those requests. It's about what we want to allow to fail independently. It's about how long we're going to, to handle the connections for the clients. For example, go routers and keep alive things, or uh, just simply how many threads does your application server need to have in order to keep everything going on. Which brings us, more or less, 
to the end of the monolith part. Yeah, that's basically it for the splitting part. And since we're here already and we have some minutes left, I would just say we basically hijacked the session a bit in order to share some pitfalls that we've seen around. And I, I personally really love pitfalls to see others uh, telling about their pitfalls. The first one um, that we would like to share with you is something we re usually refer to as the threat snare. I mean, every pitfall needs an awesome name. Threat snare. That's I, very well, actually. That's threat cool. snare. <laughs> um, so if you look, when, when you look at the picture, we, we just have a simple container and you have a JVM running in your, in your container. Um, of course, you have all the, the different memory areas in, in, in your JVM. Ben Hale yesterday did, did an awesome job in, in, in explaining that in detail. Thanks for that. Um, now, the problem that, that we see very frequently is that people tend to get careless about the amount of threads. Wait, but Java does magic with threads, right? Yeah, but the problem with threads is that they cost memory. Oh. Now, when you look, for example, at a I mean, a super simple example is a, uh, when, when you just get a cache thread pool, it, it comes with a non-controlled amount of threads. There's no upper limit with that. Um, and as said, every thread costs money, like a megabyte by default right, right now. Um, and that basically is an unrestrained memory consumption. And if you look at that, you might end up with something like that, which is not very uh, beautiful in production. So what can I do? What can I do in order to avoid that? Um, so usually it's a very good practice in that kind of area to, to really know the upper limits of your, um, of your threads in, in your application. So think about uh, fixed thread pools, uh, for example. Um, think about the, the app server threads. Tomcat, for example, uses the, uh, up to 200 threads by default. Um, look at libraries, for example. There are some, some very hungry libraries out there. Uh, fork join pools, if, if you use them. And what is very important there is that once you know your, your potential upper limit, that you really let the memory calculate later know about that. So to give Cloud Foundry the chance to consider that when calculating your memory settings during staging. So that's super important. We, um, I, I think there's even some documentation out there. We co contributed that to the open source documentation in order to, to really explain that in detail and to, and to help you out there. So the, there has, we have established a, a trend by now. It's about memory efficiency. Too many threads, they eat up memory, and it's not even from the heap. It's outside, and that causes garden to get really PC and killing your containers. But you have to be memory efficient also and especially in the heap. And, and there is a little something that we see uh, distressingly often that we like to call the death by list. Now, Java is a very convenient language. We have a lot of libraries. For example, we have the Java Persistence API. And uh, those libraries are very convenient and sometimes we get sloppy with them. For example, what we see over and over and over is that people just query the database, get whatever it's coming back, they take all those, que the, those rows from databases, put them all in Java objects, slap them in a huge list, which cannot be garbage collected very easily, actually at all, then transform it into JSON, all at once by giving it over to JSON or Jackson or whatever you're using, and then sending it over to the client. And until you are done marshalling everything to JSON, your list stays in the heap. And maybe it's huge. Maybe you think it's not, but it's huge. So, that's the reason, for example, why uh, Josh Long, the, the, the ridiculously talented person we have seen opening this track, in his talks, he, he sometimes says that, you know, we do JPA because we do bad life choices. That's, there are ways to do sanitized JPA using uh, the max uh, and, and, uh, and uh, size annotations and the paging, but there are better ways to do that. For example, streams and observables, reactive programming. What is the idea? The idea is that instead of getting all the data from the database and putting it all in a huge list and then take the huge list and put it all in a huge JSON, which is fundamentally a huge string, we're going to process the data little by little. Maybe we fetch them in, a, in, in small chunks from the database using set fetch size instead of downloading half of my SQL in, in memory, and then we process them out. And if you remember, we were talking about HTTP chunking and how that enables you to make streaming. 
And that's exactly the kind of things that you start doing here. As soon as the data are ready to be, to be put out in front of the client, you start sending them out. You don't know in advance how many they are or how big it's going to be, but they will all get that, get that out there and be very efficient. At the moment in Java, we have pretty good tools. In Java 8, uh, we have Java Streams that they allow, you, allow us to, to process fundamentally in an event-based fashion um, large amounts of data. We have even better, we have Reactive, where we have much more flexibility. If you're stuck in, uh, in a pre-Java 8 world, which sometimes it happens, um, for example, you can use Eclipse Link with, uh, with scrollable results, where fundamentally you make your own small streams. And remember, set fetch size is your friend. Now, when we start comparing reactive programming and Java streams, uh, but how many of you have heard of reactive programming? Rx Java, Reactor, awesome stuff, right? Nice, very nice. So we have two fundamental differences. Streams are push-based. You subscribe to a stream, and the stream will go to the end until you do strange stuff like throwing errors at some point just to make it break. With uh, Reactive, it's based on actually a pool model. The consumer is asking, give me more. Give me another item. Give me another emission. And then the consumer can stop. And that's very important when you write, for example, your web APIs, because sometimes the customer disconnects, even when you're halfway through giving responses, and you want just to stop it. Um, something also very important in terms of memory efficiency and using your resources well, which is fundamentally the, the base of cloud, is the idea of back pressure. The back pressure are mechanisms in Reactive where the consumer can tell to the producer, for example, the piece of code that gets data from the database and gives it over for marshalling to JSON that it's overwhelmed, it's too much, we are not making it fast enough, please slow down. And that means that you're using, you're piling up less resources to serve the same amount of requests. In terms of parallelism, it's, we are getting there with Reactive. Reactor is doing a pretty good job, and so is RxJava2. Uh, streams are already available for parallelism, but I cannot get my head around fork join pools, so I don't really like them very much. Now, there is one thing to say about Reactive programming, and it is it has a learning curve. It has like, the learning curve goes like this, and then, then you you fall off, because if you're not used to think in terms of functional programming, it's really hard. Nevertheless, when you get up there in the stars, it's absolutely worth it. Then it's really good, the kind of things that you're going to do. So we wrap it up, because in uh, SAP tradition, we're over time. Oh, of course. Um, now let's just briefly recap what we've just seen in, in our session. So you start with the monolith, because it's about the smart choices. Um, then you, you start working on your SLAs in order to know what to monitor, and you think about, for example, async processing in order to splinter out, or um, API splitting and, and the edge route in order to fulfill your SLAs. Um, and you work on, on, on the topics that, that we were talking about, like, um, for example, I mean, memory management for Java in the cloud is, is king, Resiliency, is key. performance, it has to work. Absolutely. Um, but then you will eventually end up in with awesomeness, which is what we're here for. So, thank you for your time. If you like this, press that like button, which makes me feel like a YouTuber. Um, and if you like what you, what you hear, come talk to us. We are hiring. And uh, we wish you all a wonderful day. Cheers. Thank you.